Cutting polystyrene foam is easy with a hot wire cutter, but the wire sags when it gets hot and it's hard to get accurate, straight and nicely jointed edges. Want to know how to make an adjustable, accurate and reliable hot wire foam cutter? I'm going to show you how. Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and today I'm going to be covering my adjustable hot wire foam cutter. Now hot wire foam cutters are 10 a penny on YouTube. It seems one of those topics where one guy makes a video and a hundred others make their own version of it. However, I've got a couple of projects coming up where an accurate, reliable foam cutter will come in very handy. And as these other vids don't seem to cover adjustability, I've decided to share my own ideas. But in deference to those other videos, I don't want to cover the build in too much detail. But what follows will enable a complete novice to build one from scratch. It will also help guys like me who have an existing cutter get greater adjustability and accuracy from it. So let's get started. Here's my cutter and yes, I know, it doesn't look very impressive. It's a bit shabby and stained and it's a number of years old now. It's been assembled and disassembled dozens of times over the years for easy storage. I know it's not the pristine new build project that you used to see on YouTube, but this one works very well. And I'm going to show you how to build one that hopefully looks a bit better. And more importantly, I'm going to show you how to improve upon this original design. Now this is what we're heading towards. Our fully adjustable self-tensioning hot wire cutter. And let's have a look at the parts list. As you can see, this isn't an exact science. I always have this habit of building with whatever I have to hand. And I'd really recommend that you do the same. But the materials and dimensions shown here are a pretty good guide for you. What you probably won't have to hand is the wire. And for that you're going to need a nichrome wire. Uh, fortunately this is very cheap and easily available on eBay. I got a 4 metre length for just a few pounds and that will probably last me forever. I know some people use piano wire and some people use guitar strings. And if you've got those materials to hand give them a try. Just make sure it's really nice and thin. Thinner the better. You're also going to need an electrical transformer and that's something that reduces the mains power in your neck of the woods to a safe and dependable voltage. Now I'm going to cover the transformer in more detail towards the end of this video as that's a very important topic. But for now let's just stick to the build. This inverted L forms the arm of the cutter that holds the hot wire. Glue and screw it for strength and ideally cut a small slot or rebate towards the bottom that's the same height as the thickness of the board that you're going to use to form the base. I used a square piece of MDF for my base. This is nice, flat, stable material. To the bottom of this I attached a couple of wooden blocks to act as support or legs. It's worth noting here, leave yourself a good clear section around the perimeter of the board so that you can use clamps later on. With the base sorted, it's just a matter of gluing and screwing the arm onto the board. If the rebate that you cut was nice and tight, it should be an absolute doddle. You'll see on the images throughout this video that I use brackets on mine, and that's because I don't use glue. I like to be able to take my cutter apart for easy storage. But really, gluing and screwing is the way to maximise strength, so it's the way to go. Now we need to establish where the microm wire will pass through the baseboard. You can use a square for this if you have one that's large enough. If not, and as long as you're working on a nice level surface, a simple plumb line will do just as well. Notice that the line does not begin at the end of the arm, but it's actually a couple of centimetres or a good inch away, and this is to allow for adjustment later on. With the spot marked where the wire needs to pass through, and using probably the finest drill bit you've got, drill a perpendicular hole. Looking at the underside of the board now, you can see that I took an ordinary steel washer and I drilled a hole through it with the same drill bit. Any piece of metal will do for this, I just happen to have a washer to hand. The wire passes through the face of the board and then through the hole drilled in the washer. The washer is fixed in place and this is to prevent the thin wire from slicing through the soft MDF or even from scorching it. A terminal block is screwed nearby and a length of electrical wire is within it. The nichrome wire is screwed into this and of course the nichrome wire is going to be under a lot of tension and could easily pull from the terminal block. 
So because of this, I clamped the wire in place using a small metal bracket. Again, anything will do for this purpose as long as it's metal, even another washer. It just needs to hold the wire firmly in place. Coming back to the diagram now on the upper side of the cutter, you can see the nichrome wire feeding through the drill hole. You can also see there's another terminal block being attached to the lower section of the arm and the electrical wire from the underside of the base has been connected into it. This second terminal block is where the power adapter is connected. There should be two wires coming from it, a positive and a negative, and this should be low direct current voltage and not mains voltage. Now that's critical to understand. If you get this part wrong, you could easily be creating something that could potentially kill you. So please watch out for the full explanation of transformers later on in this video. For the cutter to work, you don't really need to understand which of the transformer wires is positive or negative. Though the positive is often red or white, and the negative is generally black. But this knowledge is helpful, particularly if you want to add a light, as you'll see later. You'll also see here that I've added a switch. Now I happen to have an old domestic light switch to hand, so I use that. You will need a switch as you shouldn't leave the cutter turned on uh, when it's not in use as it will very quickly burn out the nichrome wire. An electrical wire is attached to the second terminal of the terminal block. That's the brown wire in my diagram and this is not the wire from the base of the cutter. This brown wire simply goes into the switch and out again. You can see the reverse side of the light switch here. Typically there are two terminals or connection points on such switches and the brown wire goes into one of these. A second brown wire is screwed into the other terminal. This second brown wire is attached to the adjusting bracket that we'll see in a moment. A simple ring connector can be used for this. Let's just briefly look at the electrical circuit we've now made. The first part of the circuit is the nichrome wire and this is passed through the baseboard into a terminal block through an electrical wire and to a second terminal block. This is connected to one of the wires from the power transformer. From the transformer, power can pass through the second transformer cable into the terminal block, into the switch, through the switch if it's turned on, and out the other side, along and out of the adjustable bracket, and the circuit is complete. OK, yours won't glow luminous blue, but you get the idea. Now let's take a closer look at the adjustment bracket. Now this is simplicity itself. It's just a length of metal, ideally four or five inches long, but crucially it has a slot running down its length. It's through this slot that the bracket is attached to the arm of the cutter. I made use of an old radiator bracket, which I crudely cut down. So I'm sorry if the aesthetics aren't very appealing folks, but at the time I was more interested in functionality. And as far as I was concerned, this bracket was a gift from the DIY gods. If you can't find something suitable and have to fabricate a bracket, Make sure that the slot is about 50% wider than the width of the bolts that you'll use to fix it in place. A loose fitting is crucial to this design. As I say, metal is ideal due to its strength and conductivity, but you could use plywood or something similar. Though remember that you'll need to connect the switched brown wire directly to the nichrome wire. Towards the end of this bracket, you'll need to drill a fine hole for the nichrome wire to pass through. With the bracket resting on the arm, drill a couple of pilot holes with a drill bit that's just a little bit smaller than the diameter of your bolts. You can then turn the bolts with the spanner into the timber and you should find that they grip very well. You only need to sink roughly half the length of a bolt into the arm. The other 50% holds two nuts per bolt. The lowest bolt is tightened by hand so the bracket can move but only just. Later, when you're happy with the placement of the nichrome wire, you can fully tighten the lower nut. One of the upper nuts can clamp down on a ring connector, securing the electrical connection. This nut on nut practice is a good method of preventing unwanted loosening. This clamp is, of course, the secret of the vertical alignment. The bracket can be moved to a desired location, and this in turn adjusts the vertical angle of the nichrome wire. Ideally, you want this to be perfectly perpendicular to the baseboard, helping you achieve nice 90 degree cuts when in use. You can see from the video just how much play there is in the bracket. With careful adjustment, a hell of a lot of patience, and the use of a good square, a perfectly true wire is achievable. But of course, 
that's not doable until the Nichrome wire is under tension. Now here I'm going to show you two ways of retrieving this tension. One is through gravity and one is through the use of a spring. Let's start with gravity. Gravity is constant and free, so to use it we need to find a way of having gravity pull on the wire for us, and we can do this by simply attaching a weight. If you look closely at the bracket, you'll see that I've used a small file to add a U-shaped groove in the metal. It doesn't need to be large as the wire is very thin, but it does need to be smooth to avoid snagging the wire. You can use this groove as a pivot point, and from it we can suspend a weight. Heavier is best as it will tighten the wire better, but of course if it's too heavy it will snap the wire. You can see I used a 12mm bolt to act as a weight. This hangs far below the main drop of the nichrome wire, so as not to interfere with it. The wire can be gripped between two nuts, and I eventually added four nuts in total to increase the weight. But to be honest, I don't really think this was heavy enough. I think really I could have gone three or four times the weight. But at the time, this is all I had to hand. A tiny spot of oil on the pivot point will help the weight pull nicely on the wire, and it will keep it from snagging. But of course, we don't want the oil going too far down the wire, otherwise it will smoke and smell. This process does work, and I did use it briefly. It holds the wire taut, and it can enable fine adjustment. But as I say, heaviest is best. Personally, I prefer to use a compression spring. The spring needs to be quite strong. If you can squash it easily with your fingers, it's probably too weak. If you can't budge it, it's probably too strong, so you're looking for something in between. The nichrome wire is simply fed through the spring and it's clamped onto the top. I used a small bolt and a couple of nuts to achieve this. Importantly, you need to compress the spring a little before tightening the nuts and clamping the wire in place. It's fiddly and you'll feel like you'll need an extra four pair of hands to do it, but it can be done. And once it's held in place, the nichrome wire will be permanently under tension from the spring. Again, not too much tension, otherwise the wire will snap, but enough so that you can play a tune on it. Listen to this. You get the idea? It's certainly nice and taut. And even when it gets hot and it expands, it still remains taut and good enough to make a nice straight cut. So there you have it, an adjustable self-tensioning hot wire foam cutter. Surprisingly simple, isn't it? And you can leave it there. But light in my shed isn't great and I fancy adding a light to mine. If you've seen my video on homemade custom daytime running lights, you'll remember I made use of these Eagle Eyed LEDs. These are nice and bright and have a low power consumption. They also happily work between 6 and 12 volts, and as my transformer is 12 volts, I couldn't resist. Wiring the LED into a circuit is easy, but you'll need to know which wire is positive and which is negative. On my diagram, the brown wire is the positive connection, and this is the one that passes through the switch. So that's the perfect place to connect the positive lead of the LED on the switched terminal of the switch. That way, the light will only be on when it's in use. This acts as a reminder that the power is on, helping you avoid burning out the nichrome wire if the cutter's not in use. The negative lead joins the blue cables in the terminal block, completing the circuit. So now, when the switch is turned on, the wire gets hot, ready for use, and the light shines down on the work. I left my LED suspended. This means I can alter its position if I need to, but if you prefer, you can fix yours in place. That's really down to you. And I think that's it. Now all we need to do is discuss the power transformer in a little bit more detail. Now this is probably the most difficult part of this video for me to comfortably narrate. I've been making hot wire cutters since I was a kid so I have no fear of them and I'm probably too flippant in my choice of power supply for my own good. So please do check out what other people say on the subject. What is a transformer? As I said earlier, it's a device to convert the mains voltage in your area to a safer lower voltage. Here in the UK, mains voltage tends to be between 220 and 240 volts. In the US, I believe, it's around 110 volts. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what the mains voltage is in your area, as long as the transformer you use is meant 
for use in your region of the world. So when you source a transformer, make sure you obtain it locally. Now, me being me, I didn't buy my transformer. Well, I did, but not for this project. If you're anything like me, you've probably got a drawer full of things that look like this, and they're left over from answer phones and kids' toys and all sorts of things. And what happens is the device breaks down and you throw it away, but somehow the transformer stays behind. And for this project, that's just what we want. I sorted through my box of old transformers and I found a 12 volt direct current transformer. Reading the label, it said that it was about two and a half amps of current and that was perfect for this project. And that's the sort of thing you're looking for. Low voltage, decent current handling. If the current rating is too low, your transformer will burn out. There are lots of clever people out there talking in terms of Ohm's law, resistance, ampage, voltage calculations and what have you. And to be honest, they're absolutely right. The problem is I'm too damn casual about this whole thing to be bothered, to be honest. I know it's wrong to say that, but at least I'm being honest with you. For me, the voltage and current were okay. So I wired the whole thing together and gave it a blast. And it worked. The wire didn't glow, which it shouldn't. If it does glow, it's a sign of overpowering and it cut nicely without smoke or what have you. So for me, the whole thing was okay, it worked. Now you can be similarly flippant if you wish, but just make sure that your voltage is nice and low first. Don't go with a high voltage output, go with something nice and low first. It's the safest bet. It doesn't have to be direct current, it can be alternating current for a, a hot wire cutter, but generally speaking, these sort of transformers are DC, a direct current, and that's because they're used to power devices that normally run on batteries. I've heard some guys use 24 volt transformers, and personally, I wouldn't go that high. For me, between nine and 12 volts is ideal. It's nice and low and safe. As long as the transformer says it can handle a couple of amps or more, it shouldn't burn out. If your transformer fails to heat the wire enough to cut foam, you may have to shorten your nichrome wire and thus reduce its resistance, or you'll need to increase the voltage of your transformer, in other words, look for another transformer altogether. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a model railway controller, this might be ideal. These usually allow you to vary the voltage between 0 and 12 volts typically and tend to normally be good for two and a half amps or more. I've got an old clipper controller that's got to be 40 years old and it's still going strong. But please do check the ampage if you've got one. If it's not two amps or above, don't risk it. Current is what drives these wire cutters, not the voltage. Remember that if the, the ampage is too low, you'll just burn out your transformer. It's not worth it. Now, in the description underneath this video, I've included a few links to excellent websites that cover this topic in much more detail than I have. If you know a good site, then please let me know and I'll tack it onto the description. But for me, folks, that's it. I'm all done on the subject of transformers for now. Just make sure it's low voltage and make sure that the current is a couple of amps or more. That should land you in good stead. But remember, check out these other sites. They know more than I do. Just one quick tip now before I'm finished. It occurred to me a nice simple way of increasing the tension on a compression spring is to use a washer. Now here you can see a penny washer and what I've done is just taken an ordinary hacksaw and I've cut a thin slot in it. By using this I can wedge this washer underneath the spring and thus increase the tension. So if you need to increase the tension on your spring a little bit there's a nice tip for you. You could use one, two, three, four, however many washers you need it to. And that's it folks, we're all done on this subject. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you have, please like it, it's a big help to me. If you could subscribe, that would also be great. And if you've got any questions, please do get in touch or drop a comment below, that'd be fantastic. And um, please do check out the websites I mentioned in the link and look out for other videos on this topic. It's well covered on YouTube, but as I say, I think the business of adjustability, I hope you will find particularly helpful here. Do look out for my YouTube channel. I 
got to 30 or 40 odd videos out there now. I'm doing quite well. And I'm getting some really nice positive comments. So if there's anything you want me to cover, do let me know. But in the meantime, thanks very much for watching.